Yo, what's good? Shit, we about to react to Michael Cooper response to JJ Reddick dumbass comment about Larry Bird. Let's get into it. I want to talk about uh, uh, Nick. The one thing I want to talk about is I hate when players compare each generation or or each decade, each decade with a decade with a decade, and we come to the current position now to where you have uh, great players, LeBron, Curry, Durant, just to name a few. But it's so unfair. Well, you know what I'm going to say? This J.J. Reddick, this kid here, you know, this kid here who's a journeyman, played for six different teams, all his accolades came in college, played 15 years in the NBA, was being shifted around from team to team because all he could do was shoot. And he wasn't that great of a shooter. He was a poor man, Danny Ainge, because Steph is being played more physical. They got his hands on him. In today's NBA, I don't know what game he's looking at. If, if, I, you can't touch the guy. Anytime you touch anybody, a three-point shooter, come close to them when they're landing, it's a foul. J.J. Reddick needs to be quiet and stop trying to compare. Yeah, get on his ass, Coop. Get on his ass. Go tell that little boy, tell that little ass boy to go sit down. Little ass boy, go sit down. Go suck your mama titty or some shit. Get on his ass. Yes, sir. I think he's gotten out of this what he wants to is that his name being thrown around and the attention and all that. But you know what? It's attention that he's not going to want because a lot of former players, myself just as one, along with Dominique, talk about this guy who's a poor man, Jeff Hornacek, uh, a guy that, uh, uh, you know, why would he even say that? And when all he got, and when he's talking about that, Clicks you guys and you can't say that by watching game film. You have to talk to the players that lived it. I lived that 80s era. With, and Larry Bird was one of the greatest three-point shooters that's ever played this game. Fuck percentages. It ain't about that. It's about hitting big shots. Things that he couldn't do as a player without getting a pick set for him. So, uh, you know what? <laughs> that boy could get wide open with no damn picks. Cooper on his ass. JJ Reddy can't get no fucking open shot. He couldn't even create his own shot. Don't compare each generation. And I appreciate and love basketball. I enjoy each decade. Mm -hmm. You know, I have so much respect going all the way back to the 60s and watching Bob Cousy. That's and where it started. Cousy. That's where it started with Reddick. Not to interrupt you, but about six months ago or a year ago, Reddick was calling Bob Cousy a plumber who couldn't dribble with his left hand. But he got a lot of nerve to say that about Bob Cousy. He could barely dribble with his left hand, with his right hand. And that was the best hand he had, J.J. Reddick. Couldn't get open without a pick being set. So, you know, that, that guy, man, it's, it's sad because... Um, you, you have to have respect from where this game comes from. All these guys in today's game, I'll say from maybe five years ago up until where it's going to go, are living, playing, breathing off the shoulders of Bob Cousy, Will Chamberlain, Bob Pettit, players that came in. And then you just go through the decades as you come up with Jerry West, Will Chamberlain, Elgin Baylor. These guys are making money. Make you having fame with the way that we used to play the game. And for him to call out, and you know what? I hate Larry Bird, but I respect the hell out of that man because I went against him in all those championships and during the year. I, I, all we did as the Lakers is thought about the Boston Celtics. When our season began, yeah, we had to play the Seattles, the, the Phoenixes, the, all those teams. But our main goal was to prepare, uh, sharpen ourselves up because the Celtics were the team that we had to beat. And I can honestly say, knowing the late, great Dennis Johnson, we ate, Dennis and I were very good friends. Grew up here in Los Angeles, him playing, but he used to say the same thing. Coop, you know what? We knew we had to go to Cleveland and, and, and Philadelphia, but we knew to win a championship, we had to play against the Lakers. So the respect that we've had for one another, is immense. It's 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 uh, legendary. And, you know that I live and breathe and gauge my career by my battles with Larry Bird and our battles with the Boston Celtics. So you know, for guys to kind of compare because basketball is the same. The only thing about the basketball now is the players change. You know, you go through the era, and I, I, I always say this: 
Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. You cannot say those guys' names separately. You- yeah, you couldn't. You couldn't though, because shit, they could dominate in any era. A lot of people talking about they couldn't play. You crazy as hell, boy. They could play in any goddamn era. Magic can pass, goddamn. He could do all type of shit. He could rebound, goddamn score. Bird had that jump shot. They could play in any era. They could dominate easily. That's not even a question. If you if you if you doubt that shit, you don't even know basketball. You probably can't even touch a, the fucking net of the rim. Probably, you can't. Even, you probably can't even wipe your own ass if you're trying to debate about that. Have to say though, when you say Larry Bird, you gotta say Magic Johnson. When you say Magic Johnson, you gotta say Larry Bird because they're the ones that set the NBA. In the 60s and 70s, basketball was just an America's game. Mm-hmm. It was America's game, and that's it. From the East Coast to the West Coast, from the North to the South, it was just America. Now you bring in Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, and they popularized, popular, popularized the that's game nice. and made it more popular and famous to be uh, an American citizen, American basketball player. Mm-hmm. Then you go from the middle 80s to late 80s, and then you come into the 90s where Michael Jordan became the player, and Michael Jordan took us global. He took us international. The mm-hmm. long pants, you know, the longer shorts, the gun sticking out, the more athleticism. And now as we see basketball, basketball is a worldwide uh, uh, a fun game to be played no matter where you are in this world. And for people to compare, especially this guy, J.J. Reddick, for players to kind of, for him to be saying things like that is just, um, you know, you're supposed to be a lover of this game or, or, or a student of the game. How can you say that about one of the greatest players to ever play this game and not have played against Larry Bird? To say that Steph is getting more contact, man, that guy has no clue of how basketball was played in the 80s. And I guarantee you this, J.J. Reddick, if you had played in the 80s, this is Michael Cooper talking, I'd have locked your ass up. Yeah, you will lock your ass up. That's what I'm talking about, Coop. Yes, sir. Talk your shit. Talk your shit, gang. You wouldn't have got a shot off. You wouldn't have got nothing off. You had spent more time on the bench mm. than on the floor. When I was on the floor, you couldn't have played when I was on the yes, floor. Yes, sir. I'm you that. Cool. Uh, so the main I, I, my, I have been so outspoken on this. You were overseas when it happened. I felt the need to kind of rally not that bird needs my defense but you're my friend you don't need my defense either it speaks for itself but i felt the need to kind of pinpoint you because you're the guy larry bird said was the toughest man to ever defend him people could say oh they only saw each other twice a year no i'm sorry for like four years you saw each all you guys nine times a year plus all the preseason games you guys played and had fights in the preseason games but his argument is and in my opinion bird is probably a fringe top five three-point shooter right if you're bringing in today's players, but it's his dismissive attitude and the way that he kind of looks at Mad Dog like, what are you, nuts? So let me ask you this. He says on pin downs, on curls, which Larry Legend was, and you know this better. Michael Cooper looking like he don't want to hear that shit. <laughs> He's like, I played against Bird. I know, I know Bird Kahoot. I don't want to hear that shit. <laughs> that's, a, that's how Cooper looking. Anybody. No, he ran off picks like amazing. Max always tells the story about <clears throat> him coming off a, a, a curl and, or going into a curl and him saying, screaming at Max, pick Cooper, because you were so draped all over him that there was no way they could get it. He could get open. But he doesn't even recognize the fact that Bird's ball fakes, pump fakes, movement without the ball, running people into picks. That has to be accounted for and why maybe some of those shots were open. But Coop, the first thing that came to my fa- my mind when I heard this was you actually weren't in the play. It was 87, Worthy ripping his jersey off. I mean, he stuck to him like glue. Bird breaks free, and who does he shoot it over? Michael Thompson, who that would have been called a foul today in today's rules. Michael Thompson hit his arm, and he hits that three-point shot. That kind of sums it up. Now, let me ask you this. How much did you guys, Pat Riley, Coach Riley, you know, prepare you and this is going to sound like a stupid question, but I think young fans need to hear this. 
prepare you for guys like for Larry Bird when you were in the finals? You know what, Nick, the one thing about Coach Riley, and I've always said this about him, yeah, he was a taskmaster. He ran the shit out of us. He did all that. But he was, when the playoffs started, especially when we got to the finals and we saw the Boston Celtics, his attention to detail was better than any, well, I've only played for him, well, a couple of coaches, but Pat Riley was my main coach for any coach I've ever been around. I mean, we knew what play when they call four down, three out, 33 seed, we, whatever it was to get Larry open, we knew zipper, whatever, we knew where the ball was going to go. And that's what made Larry larger than life because he knew that we knew that he was going to get the basketball. And when he came off a down pick and they picking me and Kareem or Worthy, we stepped out on him. Larry always had, let, let, let me see. Let, yeah, please. This is one thing. This is one thing I, I, I said, you know, Larry never really talked to me, but one particular in the 85, you know, the 84 series, <clears throat> we're playing in the, in the, in the forum. And this particular play down, it was a timeout, and they're coming down, and Larry gets me at the top of the key, and he's walking me underneath his basket. He goes, Cooper, I'm ready to wear your ass out. What? Okay, I get down on my best defensive stance. He goes down the lane, he comes off the left side, and Robert Parrish sets a pick. Great picker. Great picker. Comes off, and we knew the play. We knew what was coming up. And Kareem was ready, and as Larry comes off the pick, shoulder to shoulder with Parrish, and I'm take trailing behind him, he catches the basketball right about the elbow, and he gets the ball and he goes up, and Kareem stops him from turning the corner. Larry catches the ball, he goes up in the air, and here I come, and I'm like, I'm getting ready to smash this shit, man. So I jump up, and I got my hand, and I don't know how Larry got this ball between Kareem and I, because Kareem had his hands up. I'm coming with my right hand, because, and he had a great pass. I, I, like I said, I don't know how he got it to him. Gets Robert Parrish for a roll to the basket, Robert dunks it. And Larry looks over his shoulder at me and he laughs. He said, I told you, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yo, he talking shit when he made that pass. He was like, damn. Damn, he, he did that to you, Coop? Damn. It sounded like Bird was a savage. That right there, uh, that, that shows you the essence and who this guy was. He was about team. He was about winning. He was about making plays. And you know what? If anybody in today's game, Carmelo Anthony, who's no longer in this game here, maybe Kevin Durant, maybe Steph Curry comes off that, they force that shot up there. Mm. They try to get the shot off. But that's the difference between Larry. That play right there softens you up for the next time. Now Kareem's not going to jump out. Yeah, like he took better shots, shot, shot selections, and I'm pretty sure his percentage was probably better too. Now Larry's wide open to shoot the ball. So people don't know and understand the dynamics of basketball and when great players – you know, the game comes so simple to us, and the layman's person that's sitting down, the armchair guy is sitting there, and he goes, wow, what a great pass. They don't know the, pro the process of what that play has developed now. That play now has taken Kareem out of the action, so Larry can really come off and hit that shot because I'm trailing behind him. So, you know, and J.J. Reddick should know that kind of stuff. You know that because you you made a living. That's how you got open with Orlando with guys. He don't. He don't. He don't know nothing about that. He just knows the likes and the views and the clicks and shit. And, oh, let me stir some shit up and let me say some dumb shit for, for the clickbait. And, and, oh, this this shit, this shit could get my podcast high and shit. That's all he doing it for. I mean, he's a fucking clown. I mean... The shit he say is lame. Like, the shit is what? If you want me to be real and honest with you, or, or Reddick be saying, JJ be saying, whatever the fuck his name is, like, the, that boy is just super fucking lame. Like, like that boy, what the fuck? Like, that boy, that boy is lame as fuck. Cam Savage. 23 bitch made. JJ Reddick is bitch made as well. Super bitch me, super. And you coming off wide open because you damn sure couldn't get open one on one and beat anybody. And that was shown when you were with the Clippers. That's why they traded you on to the next team. So uh... those kind of plays and those kind of instances is where I would expect 
former players to really understand that and not make judgment because this game is beautiful. I enjoyed it. I enjoy the game today. It's not as, as fun. It's not as artistic, but it's still a good basketball game. These guys are very good shooters. Steph Curry, uh, I can't wait to uh, see Durant get back and play with Phoenix because they don't show them. That's a whole nother beast in the in the West now. And it's another team that the Lakers have to contend with. But these comparisons that are made, let that be made by the fans that never played this game. Uh-huh. Let them argue about that because you can always say, oh, they don't know. They ain't never played this game. They ain't been out of the court. But for a former player, and we all make our comparisons, but I try not to, yeah. but I never, ever discount another player at any decade. You know, Bob Cousy was a hell of a player for his decade, and he was a player that now that I think the way they call the game now, Bob Cousy would be a great point guard in our, league, our game today. So, don't, uh, you know, yeah, we hammer him, J.J. I still have respect for him because 15 years in this league has some kind of merit to it. You know, anybody that plays one or two for 15 years. But, you know what, watch your mouth, man. When you're talking about former players and who can do this and who can do that. Because this game, the game changed in the 80s because it was so physical. They had to stop that. Remember, I was watching the... I take the other day with Dr. J and Larry Bird. Them yeah. trying to come out of the East and Doc pounded Bird. <laughs> How about Red coming out on the court? Red was out on the court. Red Auerbach comes down to him and cheap Billy Cunningham or something. Doc is the most mild mannered person, man. <laughs> and, and to see him get robbed. But you know what? We were fighting for championship. They knew they had to beat the Celtics to come out the East. And the two times they did, they lost one time and then they came back the next year and beat us. So it was a dog fight, man. And you know what, cool. Dominique, you know, guys that probably never got a good opportunity to play for a championship, it's because you had to go through so much. But the Atlanta Hawks were oh, Barkley. reckoned with uh, coming in. So, you know, um, I'm not going to give him too much of a pass, because, but I'll give him a pass because I think he got out of this. J.J. Reddick is people talking, saying out his name. And, you know, this is a big deal. You know, hey. Yeah, it sounds like he, J.J. Reddy just be talking inside of his ass, inside of his neck. He don't even have a fucking clue what he be saying at times, man. You're a fucking clown, man. You, like, man, ain't you played in the league? You you down you downplaying the generation that was before you? They paved the way for you, dumbass. We give it to you. But you know what, dude? Watch your mouth, man. Facts. One more minute. So... Let me ask you this now. Those because he used the phrase I Larry Bird took most of his distance threes with no one within five feet. Now I first of all think that's a silly comment, but it did happen. But wasn't that a product of the fact that if you played up on Bird there, it was like the lesser of two evils. If you played up tight on him behind the three, he's going to pump fake you, not you necessarily, but an average defender that in that era, pump fake you, drive, either get a mid-range jumper or a great pass. I mean, this man was one of the greatest passing forwards ever. So, like, I would think it's a lesser of two evils. Like, the Celtics back then, and no one knows this better than you, but they used to always establish post game to open up their perimeter game. Right, like they'd start hammering into McHale and Parrish and Max, so that way they could be open from the outside. Yes, there was less spacing, but that does not mean it was less physical. Like that's, I think that's what it all comes down to. In order to get to the point where you're open for a three, oh, um, you're usually going through a gamut of of physicality back then. I mean, taking all the because this is what the young people love to say. Taking all the fighting, including the Dr. J, everything. Pretend that the NBA was as stringent today with fighting, not physicality, with fighting as it is now, right? Back then. No, the NBA is too soft. Like, it's too fucking soft. Even by you saying a, a, a word, like, a, you, you can't even trash talk. That's how soft the NBA is. It's too fucking soft. It's too soft like this pussy on IG. Like, it's real soft. It's too fucking soft. <laughs> like, this clown shit to me. Like, you can't, the ref, the rest do all this lame, lame uh, banana cake shit on, on the calls. Like, man, come on, man. You got to let them go play. Like, damn, like, y'all, y'all just be on it. Y'all, y'all got to hop off, hop off my dick, hop off my dick and let them play on some shit. Like, the fuck? So take all the fighting away. 
was the game still more physical without, you know, the occasional brawl? Oh, for sure. Still right. physical. I think you, you know, uh, what was a finesse team for Phoenix? Alvin Adams, uh, Danny Ainge when he was there, Dennis Johnson was there. They weren't considered a physical team. I mean, uh, a, a roughhouse team, but they were still very physical. There was a lot of... Uh, Okay, man. Like, comment, subscribe, share the video. I agree with everything Cooper, Michael Cooper was saying in the video. I agree. He was speaking nothing but facts. I mean, I agree with it. Shit, I mean, J.J. Reddit just be clicking and for likes and views and shit. He's a fucking clown. Man, you don't have a fucking clue what he be saying, man. But I'm out, man.